production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the Waters of the U.S. rule takes effect for many states, but not all. The Food Factor declares war on junk food. Find out how you and your kids can win. In Southern Gardening, Gary Bogman will share some of the ways he keeps cool when the temperatures climb. In the markets, OA Cleveland says there is a bottom now for cotton and it's got good support. Meanwhile, soybean prices continue to be pressured by the downturn in the Chinese economy. And the feature segment will step back 10 years to the time when Hurricane Katrina took aim at the heart of Mississippi's poultry industry. I just wanted to cry. Honestly, I just wanted to cry. And of course, the chi all the tin was off of this house. All the curtains were shredded on both houses. And we had six, eight week old chickens in those houses. So there was nothing else we could do. I mean, you know, they had to be fed and watered no matter what. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. A federal judge has issued a temporary restraining order in the waters of the U.S. controversy, but not all states benefited. Artis, a North Dakota federal judge ruled Friday, August 28th, the Environmental Protection Agency could not implement its new WOTUS rule in 13 states. Mississippi was not one of them. The 13 had requested the injunction. The judge may extend the temporary injunction to apply to all states. The EPA is expected to fight the ruling. Lots of young people go to summer camp, but not many encounter livestock when they get there. In preparation for contests this fall, 4-H and FFA members attended the MSU Livestock Judging Camp during the summer. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from Mississippi State University. At this summer's Livestock Judging Camp, young people learned how to evaluate and rank cattle, sheep, goats, and hogs, then present their decisions to a judge. Brett Crow, Mississippi State University animal and dairy science instructor, says they're learning these skills during a very important time for the cattle industry. We're seeing really record highs in terms of cattle prices right now, and uh, these young people are learning really about four different species, all the meat animal species, but cattle being one of them, and learning how to make selection decisions that are informed based on genetic merit uh, that those cattle offer and also the, the phenotypic or visual differences that they see that would serve to be economically important and that's really especially important right now as high as cattle prices are any mistakes that they might make in a breeding program at home would be very expensive mistakes. When it comes to selecting quality market animals Lana Estes of Benton County describes some traits to look for. Market animals you're going to eat them so they need to be well muscled they need to be able to walk for a while on concrete which is hard because they'll be on that for a while and they just need to have a lot of muscle so you can get plenty of meat out of them. They need to be bold ribs so they can have plenty of shape to them and dimension and power to help lengthen their stride so they can walk well. You can place the class strong and if you have good reasons it'll bring you up but if you don't know what you're talking about your reasons will show it because you won't have very good reasons. Adult volunteers also attended the camp to learn how to prepare youth for livestock shows or contests. From Mississippi State University, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Most people have a weakness for junk food, especially kids. How can you get around it? Well, in this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension gives us some tactics to fight the war on junk food. Summertime is the perfect time to fight the war on junk food. 
All you need is a little creativity to make some cool and healthy treats. Try cutting your favorite fruits into bite-sized pieces, such as crushed pineapple, canned mandarin oranges, bananas, grapes, and apples. Stir in vanilla yogurt for a delicious, ready-to-serve treat. Chill and spoon the mixture into ice cream cones for a cool and healthy alternative. Another way to satisfy that summer sweet tooth, frozen banana pops. Take half a banana, insert a popsicle stick, dip it in yogurt, and roll thoroughly in chopped nuts, crushed cereal, or coconut. Freeze for three hours and enjoy. <laughs> Kids aren't the only ones fighting the war against junk food. These tasty snacks are perfect for adults too. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says if you do have an occasional junk food attack, limit the damage by watching your portion sizes. Sometimes the plants in the garden can handle the heat better than the gardener. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman gives us some of his personal ways to be a cool gardener. Gardeners in Mississippi know we need plants that thrive in the summer heat. However, working outdoors for any length of time can take a toll on even the hardiest gardener. The dangers of overheating shouldn't be ignored. According to the CDC, since 1979, heat-related deaths in the United States outnumber those from hurricanes, lightning, tornadoes, and earthquakes combined. Here are some of my simple tips to avoid heat-related problems. A good tip I follow is to plan gardening activities for the mornings and evenings, which are going to be the cooler times of the day. But if you must work during the heat of the day, try one of those new cooling towels. You wet the towel, snap it, and it magically provides cooling relief. Repeat as needed. Summer garden chores make me sweat profusely. I like to drink plenty of cool, not cold water. But don't wait until you start to sweat before you start to hydrate your body. If you know you're in for a hot day, get plenty to drink before you even step out into the heat. If you're sweating for more than two hours, use a sports drink to replace your body's salts and minerals. Working out in the garden also means to protect your skin from the sun. Sunscreens with an SPF of 30 and above help, along with your wide brim hat, to provide protection. If you find yourself feeling too hot, feeling dizzy, or breathing heavier, get to a shady location and start sipping on cool water. Just remember in the summer heat to accept you can't work as fast or get as much done as you can in the cooler seasons. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Leighton Gary says to pay attention where the shade falls in your landscape during the day and then you can plan your work to take advantage of it. In our feature segment today, we'll go back 10 years to the time when Hurricane Katrina took dead aim at the Mississippi poultry industry. Time now for the markets with Leighton, and you say perceptions about China's economy continues to influence commodity prices? That's right, the name China continues to come up, it seems, in commentaries for practically every crop these days. Let's look now at our first headlines for the new month of September in the markets. Cotton prices in all contract months find a bottom. Cheaper crude oil means cheaper hardwood prices, while feeder cattle prices look negative as we move towards fall. Mississippi State's O.A. Cleveland says the bottom is in for cotton and is well supported in the 61 to 62 cent channel. And he says the Chinese economy has slowed. It is not crashing. The Texas cotton crop in particular continues to deal with the aftermath of some unusual weather this year. Cleveland notes the real work for the cotton plant is just getting started there and in some other areas. He says he likes the cotton market higher. Well, these are some volatile days in the soybean markets. Beans are one of the commodities heavily pressured by those concerns over the Chinese economy and whether that country's future foreign purchases of beans may decline. DTN's Darren Newsom says there's no question the soybeans are on the struggle bus right now. I don't know that the market has changed as much fundamentally 
from the demand side, as everyone's saying. Nevertheless, reality is reality, market moved to a new low, money continues to come out of soybeans. And as long as there's a perception of Chinese problems and this is going to change all of these things, soybeans are going to struggle. The soybean market's going to bottom out. Uh, if it doesn't, it's going to spell problems for, for you know, markets that are tied to it. Um, but I, I think it's going to bottom out. I still think it has a chance to move higher long term. We shift to forest products now. Hardwood saw timber prices have been riding high in recent years, thanks in part to increased U.S. oil and gas production. But now as that industry is dialing back, hardwood is taking a dip. And the pending Iran nuclear deal could soften hardwood even further. This Q&A with an extension economist breaks it down for you. Extension Associate Professor James Henderson is joining me this week in our market interview. I want to ask you, why is the increase in uh, oil and natural gas production in recent years, how did that spark such a, a good underpinning under hard, hardwood saw timber prices? Well, one of the inputs to the production process for oil and gas drilling is hardwood mats and board road. To, uh, support the drilling equipment to minimize uh, soil disruption and of course those are manufactured from mixed hardwood saw timber and we've really seen price improve on mixed hardwood saw timber and it started about the same point as the, the fracking phenomenon in the US and, we, and we've seen prices go up from the mid-twenties to nearly forty dollars a ton by the end of 2014. Now we all know that uh Gasoline prices, diesel prices at the pump are going down, crude oil by the barrel going down. So all this would not bode well then for uh, this aspect of uh, the use of hardwood saw timber. It's had an effect. We've seen um, mixed hardwood saw timber prices fall over the past six months to near $30 a ton from a, a recent high of near $40 a ton. And again, that's just reflecting uh, less oil and gas drilling, less need for hardwood mats and board road, and then the sawmills are getting less orders for, for those products and thus they're purchasing less hardwood saw timber and it's reflecting on the price for, for mixed hardwood saw timber. Now we're all familiar with the Iran nuclear deal presently under consideration by the U.S. Congress. Many people may not realize uh, if approved that could uh, impact or not, not help the price of hardwood saw timber. Uh, it'll have an impact on crude oil prices and, and world crude oil production. Uh, sanctions placed against Iran reduced crude oil production by a, a, about a million barrels per day. So as if sanctions are uh, released against Iran and they increase their production and add to global supply of crude oil, that's certainly going to keep crude oil prices uh, low and therefore we would not expect to see uh, a resumption of oil and gas drilling in the United States to the levels they were say a year ago which will have impacts on mixed hardwood saw timber. Time to break for a trivia quiz here on Farm Week. Our topic concerns cotton and here's the quiz question. How does Mississippi rank nationally for both cotton and cotton seed production? Is the answer A number two or B number four, C number six or D number eight? Stay with us for the answer. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports the feeder cattle market is grinding lower. In the feature segment today, we'll turn the calendar back 10 years to see when Hurricane Katrina tried to deliver a knockout blow to Mississippi's poultry industry. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The 25th Annual Mississippi Rice Tasting Luncheon will be held Friday, September 18th. It will be at the Sillers Coliseum at Delta State University in Cleveland. The hours are 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Tickets are $5. This year, a Think Rice Cook-Off will be held. Contact the Bolivar County Office of the MSU Extension for more information. 
The 6th Annual Mississippi Gourd Festival will be held the third Friday and Saturday of September. That's the 18th and 19th. Unlike previous years, there won't be a Sunday session this year. The hours are 8 to 5. Location is the Smith County Agricultural Complex on Oilfield Road at Raleigh. Admission is $2, children 12 and under free. There will be handcrafted gourds and plain gourds for sale. Classes will also be held for you to learn various craft techniques. Go to the Mississippi Gourd Society website or Facebook page for more information and to sign up for classes. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. In the beef sector, the feeder cattle market is described as slowly grinding lower. Analyst Naomi Bloom was asked for her opinion recently of this trade as the month of August ended. Still negative, actually. Okay. And um, the perception there, too, is that with the live cattle being lower, the feeder cattle are going to grind lower and that there's going to be increases in supply coming. So obviously we know it's a slow increase, but again, that perception is all that matters. Technically speaking, in the past two weeks, the feeder cattle futures broke their short-term uptrend, and then they were sitting on like that 200 even support level, which failed. So now, technically, the downside is 180, but that is the long-term uptrend. I do, though, think that we'll probably see that market drift lower in the coming months. Um, nothing quick, but just a slow grind lower because the fundamentals have just shifted enough. Back to the trivia quiz to wrap things up for this week, and the right answer is C. Mississippi is number six nationally in cotton and cottonseed production. August 29th marked the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina hitting South Mississippi. Today we're airing a feature story that we produced at that time on how Hurricane Katrina went straight up the center of the state's poultry industry. This story was shot about five months after Katrina hit. It was produced back before today's high-definition television came into being. You will notice the quality difference from modern broadcasts. Well, about, I guess about 10, 10.30 that said Monday morning, we lost power and it just went downhill for probably the next 12 hours. Like I said, you saw the pictures on the chicken houses that tore them up at the top of our house, our equipment shed, and uh, it changed our life forever. Donald and Tammy Sellers share a unique bond with the chickens on their farm. They're all Hurricane Katrina survivors. The hurricane peeled the tin off the roofs of the chicken houses as well as the Sellers' home. The Sellers run what's called a hen operation under contract to Wayne Farms. The hens and roosters produce fertilized eggs from which broiler chickens are grown. Sellers was concerned the shock of the storm, the disruption of the birds' normal routine, and the roof construction over their heads would cause them to lay less eggs, but it didn't. They had just started laying, and I don't remember just how many eggs we was getting at the time, but production just kept coming on up every day. You know, we was running fans and on our generators and stuff, and uh, it was inconvenient, but we made it through it. You know, and the birds seemed like it never bothered them, putting their tops back on and everything. When Hurricane Katrina survivors share their photos and their stories with you, it's an attempt to give you an idea of what the storm was like. But no photo can convey the scope of the damage or the mental stress of wondering if your home or livelihood will be destroyed. The sellers, however, have kept a good perspective on their losses. Well, you really didn't know, you know, just when it was going to stop. Because you just kept getting pounded and pounded and you're thinking, you know, everything I work for is going down the drain right here. But, you know, then you look at your neighbor and you think, well, I'm really blessed that I didn't get any more. That whole hurricane and its, and its push up through the state and its winds, just charted winds and everything, just went right through the heart of the industry. There are more than 1,900 broiler farms scattered among 51 Mississippi counties. 27 counties, however, have 10 or more farms each. These lay right in Katrina's path. The Mississippi Poultry Association says 206 chicken houses were destroyed. Another 353 were damaged to the point repairs could take up to a year and a half. In all, 75% of the state's almost 7,000 chicken houses suffered some sort of damage. The industry, however, is recovering much quicker than most ever believed it could. 
Some houses do remain out of service as growers deal with their insurance companies, or older growers ponder whether to take this opportunity to retire. I just didn't think we could get it done back this quick. But, uh, you know, the, the contractors, the, the contract producers, Sanderson, they've all put forth an excellent effort in, uh, in, in getting everything back going and back in production. We had the, the roof completely off of it, um, just a few pieces of tin left hanging. The doors, all the doors were tore off, insulation pulled out, and uh, now all the curtains were gone. Two of the four chicken houses owned by Danny Rustin of Jones County were heavily damaged by Katrina. Rustin raises pullets and roosters for Wayne Farms. Pullets are young females that haven't begun to lay eggs. He lost about 100 roosters, but only a few pullets. It took $90,000 in just over five weeks to get his operation repaired. I just got lucky. My in, I had a good insurance company. They, they came on out and took care of it, plus uh, I ran into some guys that, that build poultry houses and they were in a slack time, so they came right on in and put my roof on. I just wanted to cry. Honestly, I just wanted to cry. And of course, the chi all the tin was off of this house. All the curtains were shredded on both houses. And we had six, eight week old chickens in those houses. So there was nothing else we could do. I mean, you know, they had to be fed and watered no matter what. Stella McDonnell has grown pullets for 32 years for Sanderson Farms of Laurel. She and her husband Larry managed to get their houses repaired in a month's time. Insurance covered their losses. They had to totally rebuild that end of that house that had, had collapsed inside and had to put uh, new curtains on both houses. So it took a good month. Uh, and I believe my husband said probably all told. I mean, it just wiped out brooders, water lines, everything. It took everything. It just tore everything up in that half, about $46,000. Number one house was uh, nailed on with regular nails. This house was just built eight years later was screwed in. So we didn't lose a piece of tin off of, off of the number two house. The Mississippi Poultry Association estimates total bird losses at six million due to Katrina, much less than initially expected. That equals 8% of the 828 million broiler chickens Mississippi farmers grew in 2004. Mississippi is the fifth largest broiler meat producer, growing 10% of the nation's total. Poultry is Mississippi's largest agricultural commodity by far, with a production value of around $2 billion a year. That figure doesn't include the value added by the infrastructure and jobs needed to support the industry. Any given day, right now, we have 150 million birds out in the poultry houses of the state. The first thing you noticed, the roof line was just collapsed like a V down three quarters of the house, all the way down to the fans on the end. The inside walls or side walls had caved in on the sides and the front of the house was leaning in. Um, a lot of chickens had either got blown out or were climbing out over the top and jumping off. And, um, a lot of Jason Pickering out. is standing beside his completely Falcon rebuilt head. number three broiler house. It's believed a tornado spawned by Katrina hit it and his three other chicken houses. He was about to build two more houses when the storm struck. The construction company delayed the start of the new houses and repaired the damaged ones in two weeks. It took another three months to rebuild the destroyed house. The cost to Pickering's insurance company was sizable. It was between $350,000 and $400,000. Um, um, this house, like I said, was completely destroyed and um, the front of the number two house was completely destroyed. Um, a large amount of tin and um, ceiling damage to the other houses also. Mike Pepper points out new broiler houses are expensive and a new broiler farm is a big investment. But I've heard anywhere probably 180 on the low side up to 200,000 per house. And most farms now when they're uh, when they are uh, building, not adding on, but when they're building, they'll build six houses. So you can you can add up there. I mean, it's a it's a million dollars easy to to put in an operation. Jason Pickering remains optimistic about the poultry business. 
He's still adding the two new houses and believes Katrina has made the industry stronger, not weaker. Looking back, um, um, Sanderson really took good care of us and, and um, the, the government aid and everything really helped out a lot. So I, I feel really positive about the future, even if something like this does happen again, that um, everything will be in place that, that we'll make it and be better off in the long run, I believe. And you can watch this story again on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. Our Facebook page is Farm Week USA. Our website is farmweek.msucares.com. And Leighton, I want to remind everyone that story is from 10 years ago. Uh, a lot of lessons were learned about chicken house construction, how, you know, like screwing the tent on keeps it down. Uh, and then what needs to be done right after, like getting diesel out to growers so their generators can keep working. Um, they just did an excellent job, I think, in recovery, but th things have changed. There's no curtains on the houses now. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully we won't need the information they found out anytime soon. Uh, hopefully we won't. We are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll return to, the Raleigh, to Raleigh for the Mississippi Gourd Festival. Gourds are for more than birdhouses. You will be amazed at the artwork and musical instruments that can be made with gourds. They'll even teach you how to do it. And the food factor, school lunches. Find some ways to spice up your child's lunches and stay organized while you do it. In Southern Gardening, ornamental peppers. They're shiny, they have deep color, and you can eat them. Well, the rest of the Farm crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.